Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming. This is a momentous time here. What you're seeing in Portland is the end of fluoridation worldwide. It, it's... It is absolutely clear from what you've already seen in just a few weeks that they've got no arguments, no science, and you're seeing the kind of tactics which are put in place of science and solid rational argument. You're seeing tactics by stealth, you're seeing public relations spin up the gazoo. It's a completely orchestrated campaign from the moment it slipped into the newspaper. And we've got a political operative, I think, who organizes uh, at least four of the five, five campaigns. Um, you don't want to hear a great deal from me. Tonight, you need to organize, organize, organize. Affecting change is like driving a nail through a piece of wood. The experts can sharpen the nail, but you need the hammer of public opinion to drive that nail home. So I'm going to do my best to sharpen the nail tonight. I know some of you have heard these arguments against fluoridation for 10, 20, 30 years. You don't need any more arguments. But let me tell you, there are developments on a daily basis which make our case stronger. Daily basis, I heard this morning that three more towns have stopped fluoridation in Indiana. That that brings the total of towns that have stopped since October the 25th, 2010, to 56. That's over 3 million people that have stopped. And I heard this afternoon that the Premier of Queensland has called a halt to mandatory fluoridation in Queensland, something I did not expect to have. So, now, it's not my credentials that are important here. What is important for you is I tell the truth. I don't spin the science. I give the science straight to you. I'll try to do it as unemotionally as possible tonight. It, this is an emotional issue for me. I do not like science being torn up, especially the science that is meant to inform public health policy. Um, Sometimes my sense of humor slips in and I, I find humor in things which I shouldn't. And that's because I was at college with John Cleese and actually played soccer with him. So <laughs> anyway, let's, without further ado, let's go to the first slide. The inter I spent 16 years researching this issue, first as a professor, as you heard, and then secondly, as the director of the Florida Action Network. And on that, I, I rely very much on my wife, who's the webmaster, and my son, Michael, who is the, is the person that put this incredible website together, fluoridealert.org. In October of 2010, with two other authors, next, uh, James Beck, uh, MD, PhD from Calgary, and Spedding Micklem, uh, a doctor of philosophy and biology from Oxford. And I really owe a huge d d uh, def um, gratitude to them because they really got the tone right in this book. This book is not understated, uh, overstated, it's understated. Every single argument that we use is backed up with 80 pages of references. We give as many of the caveats as possible. We try to recognize the arguments of the other side. We thought it would raise the level of debate. Unfortunately, it hasn't. After 22 months, there's been no scientific response to our book from the promoters of fluoridation. And yet they continue to maintain this mantra that it's that they are the scientists, we are the junk scientists, and it's safe and effective, safe and effective, safe and effective. I really do believe that there's some kind of commission there, that every time they can get safe and effective on the airways or on public, they get a bonus. Next, <laughs> a summary of the key arguments. Uh, first of all, there is some very strong science on our side, and you're going to see that. But common sense should kill this practice. It should never have started. It's a poor medical practice to use the water supply to deliver any medicine, any medicine. <laughs> and just to demonstrate how silly it is, we've never used the public water supply since 1945, when fluoridation began, to deliver any other medicine for obvious reasons. Once you put it in the water, you can't control the dose, 
because you can't control how much water people drink. You can't control who gets it. It goes to everybody, babies, infants, children, elderly, people that are sick, people that are, uh, have poor kidney function, people have poor nutrition. Uh, ask a pharmacist if there's any drug at all that he is aware of that he can give to anyone and he doesn't have to control the dose. He'd laugh you in the face. Uh, next, of course, and key, it violates the individual's right to informed consent to medicine. And if you don't know what that's about, go to the American Medical Association because they have a lot about informed consent, what their uh, doctors should do. So what Randy Leonard and uh, Adams and, and uh, Fish, is it Fish? What they're going to do, essentially, to the whole of Portland, is what a doctor in Portland could not do to an individual patient. Fluoride is not a nutrient. Some promoters occasionally slip that it is a nutrient. It is not. It, to demonstrate that a substance is an essential nutrient, you have to starve an animal of it in its diet and demonstrate a disease. Uh, tooth decay is not caused by lack of fluoride. It's caused by too much sugar and not enough education. There is not one biochemical process in the body that needs fluoride. Not one. I challenge them to say, tell me, any molecule, any process, any reaction that needs fluoride. It isn't there. But, on the other hand, we can point to many, many uh, molecules and, and processes in the body that fluoride interferes with. It interferes with enzymes. That's why the first opponents of uh, fluoridation in this country was not the John Birch Society or the Ku Klux Klan or any of these other crazy right-wingers. It was Nobel Prize winners in enzyme chemistry, like James Sumner at Cornell. And it interferes with enzymes, it interferes with hydrogen bonds, it forms complexes with metal ions, it interferes with the active centers of many enzymes and proteins, it carries toxic metals to places they wouldn't otherwise go. You can go on and on and on, and I don't intend to. It's not substance, something that you want anywhere near your body, and certainly not your baby's body. The fluoride level in mother's milk is incredibly low. You know, I learned that fact on July 6, 1996, the first day of my involvement. And when I saw that, I said, this can't be right. Do the dentists really know more about what the baby needs than Mother Nature? We heard a spin artist on the, uh, the radio station yesterday actually intimating that they did know more about uh, what the baby needs, that breast, mother's breast milk is somehow deficient and they have to make up for it, which is, I believe, absolutely nonsense. But the key thing is that a, a bottle-fed baby in Portland, if you fluoridate at 0.7, uh, is going to get 175 times more fluoride than nature intended. 175 times more than a breastfed baby. Now, it's well established that fluoride interferes with the growing tooth cells and causes this condition called dental fluorosis. That is a systemic effect. It's an effect that takes place inside the body. The fluoride is interfering with the enzymes and proteins which make the enamel. The gamble is that you can do that to the growing tooth cells and not touch anything else in the body when that fluoride is flowing through. That is a reckless gamble in my mind. When they started fluoridation, they thought that 10% of kids would get dental fluorosis. But they didn't care because it was very mild. It was just white specks that they thought that no one would notice. 10%. Now the Center of Disease Control admits that 41% of American children, 12 to 15, this is the average of all children, whether they live in a fluoridated or non-fluoridated community, because we're getting fluoride from many other sources, have dental fluorosis. So they're four times more than their goal. And this dental fluorosis that we're getting today is not just very mild. 8.6% of these figures are mild and 3.6% are moderate or severe. Mild dental fluorosis impacts 50% of the surface of the tooth and moderate or severe affects 100% of the tooth. And tell a child who has moderate or severe dental fluorosis that this is not a problem, it's just a cosmetic effect. Because these children do not want to smile, they do not want to open their mouths on their first date. It's a, a source of intense embarrassment and psychological damage. 
According to the CDC, black and Mexican-American children have higher rates of dental fluorosis than uh, whites. Next. A Pam Dembeston on lessons from dental fluorosis. She is one of the world's experts on dental fluorosis. She said, we can certainly see that fluoride impacts the way proteins interact with mineralized tissue. So what effect is it having elsewhere at the cellular level? Fluoride is very powerful and it needs to be treated respectfully. Uh, and that was quoted in Scientific American, January of 2008. A good document actually to give to people that uh, wonder if you're Looney Tunes. It is reckless to assume that when fluoride is damaging the growing tooth cells, it's not damaging anything else. Next. Um, several lines of evidence indicate that fluoride can damage the brain, and I'll be going into that in a moment, a little bit later. I'm only going to focus on this one issue, because the evidence is very strong, and if we can prove this one point, fluoridation should end immediately. Um, the benefits of swallowing fluoride have been wildly exaggerated. Even fluoridation promoters now agree that the major benefit is topical not systemic. The Center of Disease Control conceded that in 1999, and that should have been the point when fluoridation ended. Because if fluoride works topically, then a fluoridated toothpaste is universally available, why expose every tissue in the body to a known toxic substance? And when you can apply it directly to the teeth and spit it out, and why force it on people uh, that don't want it? It's just common sense. Yeah. And this, this simple fact about it working topically, not systemically, they got this wrong for 50 years. They got it wrong for 50 years. Explains probably why today you cannot see a difference in tooth decay between fluoridated communities and non-fluoridated communities, fluoridated states and non-fluoridated states, fluoridated countries and non-fluoridated uh, countries. The bigger the study, the less likely they are to find that fluoride actually reduces tooth decay. It's only when they cherry pick the data, as they've done here, with a bogus comparison between Portland, or, or rather Oregon, and Washington State, can they pretend that there is a difference. But as I said, that is cherry picking, and the science doesn't bear scrutiny on that. The chemicals used to fluoridate are not pharmaceutical grade. They're not the kind of fluoride that you get in toothpaste. They are, in fact, the uh, products of the scrubbing systems of the phosphate fertilizer industry. A spray of water captures two very toxic gases. And these chemicals, these fluoridated chemicals, contain a lot of other contaminants. One of them is arsenic. Now, arsenic is a known human carcinogen. And for the US EPA, there is no safe level of a human carcinogen. Any amount can increase your cancer risk. So inevitably, when you're using industrial grade fluoridating chemicals to fluoridate your water, you are going to increase the cancer rates of your community, of your country. There's no argument about that. The only argument would be to two people in risk assessment to calculate just what the increased cancer risk would be. But there, you will increase the cancer risk, period. And that's over and beyond the fact that fluoride might also be a carcinogen. The science underpinning promoters' claims of safety and effectiveness is extremely poor. It was a shock to us when we had the three authors sat down and looked at the literature in some detail. The four examples of bad science. One, there's not been a single randomized clinical trial to establish that fluoride or fluoridation is either effective or safe. This is the standard procedure that the FDA uses to approve new drugs. This is the most prescribed drug in American history. Today, it's going to over 200 million people every day in uncontrolled doses through their water and through food that's made up with it, etc. The FDA has never approved it for ingestion. It remains an unapproved drug. Another uh, flabbergasting fact in a, in a whole host of flabbergasting facts. In 67 years since fluoridation began, there's been little to no monitoring 
of our exposure. There's no been monitoring, no systematic monitoring of the fluoride levels in our bones, even though we know that 50% of the fluoride we take in each day accumulates in our bones. No measure in the urine, and urine is a good measure of daily exposure, or in our blood, so critical for when you get into the biochemistry. None of that is being, being monitored, which is incredible. Even when harm has been demonstrated in other countries, countries which do not have a fluoridation program to protect, uh, countries like India and China, which have high natural levels, there has been no attempt to replicate these studies in the United States or any other fluoridating country. It's absolutely amazing. They put all their effort into critiquing the methodologies of, of studies that have found harm, but none into actually doing the studies themselves. Even though it's well established that the severity of dental fluorosis is a good indicator of how much fluoride the child has been exposed to before their permanent teeth have been uh, uh, erupted. So you've got this wonderful non-invasive biomarker which should make any epidemiology, ep epidemiologist have an instant orgasm. I mean, after all... You, you have millions of children with no dental fluorosis, very mild dental fluorosis, mild dental fluorosis, moderate dental fluorosis, and probably not millions, but thousands with severe dental fluorosis. So you've got the x-axis beautifully. So now the y-axis, you could look at any um, health concern with children that you can think up and see if there's any relationship with the, between the severity of dental fluorosis. Not once has this been done in America. Next. Instead of science, promoters use endorsements. Here's a list of endorsements from the ADA. The ADA says all these organizations endorse fluoridation. But how many of these organizations have researched the issue themselves? How many have done that recently? How many, for example, have looked at the IQ studies that uh, is very important right now? Endorsements are a good way to sell shoes but not a good way to determine public health policy. You know. <laughs> Next. Next. Many Americans might find these endorsements impressive, but clearly they didn't impress the vast majority of countries in the world, because the vast majority of countries in the world do not fluoridate their water, which includes most of Europe. Now, most of Europe has equivalent organizations, professional bodies, doctors, physicians, pediatricians, etc., as we have in America. So, apparently, all the things which are supposed to be so convincing to Randy Leonard and crew have not convinced these professional bodies in most of the world. In fact, over half the people drinking fluoridated water live in the United States. And as far as portraying Portland, as being behind the times. Um, if I was to start reading to you a list of cities in the world that do not fluoridate their water, Portland would be prouder to be in that list than in the list that is Florida. In, in Europe, 97% uh, of the population of Western Europe is not drinking fluoridated water. These countries are not fluoridated. Some of them started but stopped. Uh, four of them have fluoridated salt. Uh, but the majority have neither fluoridated water nor fluoridated salt. Rick, Hein, uh, Rick North told me today that um, maybe Spain also has fluoridated salt. So maybe it's fine. The most frequently f cited endorsement is from the uh, CDC. Um, and the statement goes as follows, and you must have seen it many, many times. Every time I see it, I want to throw up. <laughs> Fluoridation is one of the ten great public health achievements of the 20th century. I, I want to say this. Those who so glibly trot this out, editors of your papers, journalists, public health officials, Randy Leonard and crew, are going to be so embarrassed <laughs> when they really see what this statement is and where it came from. It came from not the Centre of Disease Control, the total body of 18,000 people. It came from 30 people, the Oral Health Division. Let me be more specific. 
This, the report on which that statement is based, was published in 1999. It was not externally peer-reviewed. It was an internal house document. It was written by two people, Scott Tomar, who is a dentist who had never written anything on fluoridation before this, and Susan Griffin, an economist. The report, well, no, let's, okay. They may have done really diligent study, and so we shouldn't hold their lack of credentials on this against them. But we can hold the content against them, because if you look at it, they dismiss health effects in one sentence and rely on a review that was already six years out of date when they published this report. The National Research Council report of 1993. It's ironic that the same body, the National Research Council has reported a report in 2006 and talk about a double standard. Here's this duo relying on this to dismiss health effects, but when the NRC 2006 comes back with a whole litany of health concerns, they dismiss that as not being relevant to water fluoridation. The evidence of benefit was laughable. Next, there's only one figure in this study, and it's this. And this figure shows DMFT, de tooth decay, in 12-year-olds coming down from the 60s to the 90s. And on the same graph, you see a red line. That red line is going up. Is it the sale of bicycles, telephone books? <laughs> no, this is the percentage of the American population drinking fluoridated water. So voila, the blue line is coming down because the red line is going up. Now, before you believe that nonsense, they could have easily gone to the World Health Organization and seen what was happening to tooth decay over the same period in non-fluoridated countries. Next, here it is. Next, there. There are 12 countries here which are non-fluoridated, one that has 10% fluoridation, and four that are fluoridated. They're all coming down. Tooth decay was coming down in all of those countries from the 60s and the 90s. So to ascribe the reduction in the United States to water fluoridation is either incompetence, because they couldn't be bothered to see what the worldwide figures were, or it was fraud. It was deception. It was public relations. <laughs> Next. Instead of science, uh, promoters use dummy reviews by hand-picked panels of pro-fluoridation experts. And now I want to read you a very interesting quote. It's from the book, The Fluoride Wars. And I quote from this book because this book is otherwise fairly pro-fluoridation. They certainly take this, the status quo at, at face value. This is what they say about these reviews that these promoters rely on so much. Endorsements and reviews, right? Not the primary literature. You very seldom hear a promoter refer to a primary study in the literature. Anti-fluoride forces have always claimed that the many government-sponsored review panels set up over the years to assess the cost and benefits of fluoridation were stacked in favor of fluoridation. A review of the membership of the various panels confirms this charge. The expert committees that put together reports by the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences in 1941, 1944, and 1954, the National Academy of Sciences, 1951, 1971, 1977, and 1993, the World Health Organization in 1958 and 1970, the US Public Health Services in 1991, are rife with the names of well-known medical and dental researchers who actively campaigned on behalf of fluoridation or whose research was held in high regard in the pro-fluoridation movement. Membership was interlocking and incestuous. And that is from people that are pro-fluoridation. Thank you, Freeze and Leah. Next. And I, recent bias reviews, the CDC in 1999, um, Fluoridation Forum in Ireland, I testified before that forum, that was a travesty the NHIMRC in Australia 2007, and Health Canada in 2011. And because you might think that these charges may be over the top, that you're hearing from uh, somebody who's passionate about this issue, let me give you chapter and verse here because it's important. 
Next, a recent example. A panel, this is a panel of six experts picked by Health Canada to review the literature. Uh, six experts. Next, four of these six experts to review the literature were dentists and pro-fluoridation dentists, well-known pro-fluoridation. There they are, Jay Kumar, Chris Clark, Stephen Levy, and Michael Levy. So you're going to review the literature on harm and effectiveness, and you're going to use four pro-fluoridation experts out of six to do it. The six experts, after reviewing the literature on fluoride and IQ, declared that the weight of evidence indicated that there was no problem. Question, what weight of evidence indicates that there's no problem with IQ and fluoride? I'll go through the evidence in, the, in a moment. When they came out with their report based upon these six experts, they had only reviewed five of the 23 IQ studies that were available at that time. And I provided them with references to the other 18. Next. And when the final report came out, uh, they didn't change a word of their review, and they still had only reviewed five of the ex uh, uh, studies. So you only have to be able to count up to 18 to know that we don't, we're not dealing with a, a, a straight deck here. They asked for public input, and when they were given public input, they completely ignored it. Why? Uh, why? Well, this is what I think. Next. Health agencies in fluoridated countries seem more interested in protecting this practice than protecting the health of their citizens. It's sad to say that, but sometimes people find it very difficult to escape a paradigm. They find it very difficult to admit that they're wrong. Uh, maybe they're frightened of losing credibility and losing the public's trust. But I assure them, the longer they keep this going, the more of the public's trust they're going to lose. Let's look at the real science. One of the few examples of a review that was balanced was the National Research Council review of 2006. I testified for 45 minutes before this panel. Um, here's the thing that came out, uh, fluoride in drinking water scientific review of EPA standards. Next, this review took three and a half years, was 507 pages long, 1,100 references. By the way, it was a balanced panel. So the best I can determine, there were three that were anti-fluoridation, three that were pro-fluoridation, and six who hadn't come out one way or the other. Uh, there was an exposure analysis in chapter two. And in this exposure analysis, they concluded that there were subsets of the population drinking fluoridated water, optimally the one part per million, that were exceeding the EPA's reference dose. Now, I underline that because both the ADA and CDC said that this was not relevant to water fluoridation. Look at it. They're saying there are subsets of the population that are exceeding the safe reference dose drinking fluoridated water. Now, these people obviously can't read. The ADA and the CDC, Tweedledum and Tweedledee. These subsets included high water drinkers and bottle-fed babies. The harmful effects of fluoride include dental fluorosis, bone damage, uh, lowered thyroid function, accumulation of the pineal gland, brain damage, osteosarcoma, mixed evidence on that, and the, the fact is that some people are very sensitive to fluoride, which is exactly what you'd expect, by the way, for any toxic substance. There's a normal distribution. You expect most people to have an average response, a few people to be very super resistant to the toxic, and some people to be very, very sensitive to the toxics. That's what you expect. I, I want to stress this. There's a difference between saying that fluoride harms health. Next. There is no question that fluoride harms health. Millions of people in India and China have had their health wrecked by fluoride, crippled by fluoride. There's no argument about that. We've known that since the 1940s. What is the argument about then? Next, the argument about is whether fluoridation causes harmful effects. And what that comes down to is the scientific question is there an adequate margin of safety between the doses that cause harm, which have been documented in hundreds of studies, and the doses that we are likely to get in a fluoridated community, bearing in mind you can't control the dose, 
And also, is that next, is that margin of safety sufficient to protect everyone? Not just the range of doses that people get, but the range of sensitivity. And we have a standard factor in toxicological risk assessment to protect the whole population once you've found harm. Once you've found harm, you take the dose that causes harm and divide by 10. And then you're confident that you've got a level which is safe for everybody in your population. If you divide by 10, the doses that are reported to cause harm in the National Research Council report, I can tell you categorically there is no adequate margin of safety to protect everyone drinking fluoridated water and, of course, getting more fluoride from other sources. One of the conclusions, NRC, it is apparent that fluorides have the ability to interfere with functions of the brain. The NRC review only looked at five IQ studies, and they drew that conclusion from both these IQ studies and animal studies. Um, the most important study, in my view, at that time was one by Zhang, and I'm very familiar with this study because Zhang invited me, he works for the CDC in China, he invited me to go to China and look at these villages for myself. There are two villages, one in the well water had less than 0.7 parts per million, and the other village had between 2.5 and 4.5 parts per million. Next. He controlled for lead exposure and iodine, which could both could conflict with this finding. No difference. And he found a drop of 5 to 10 IQ points across the whole age range. Next. And the drop in IQ correlated with fluoride levels in the urine. Now, this recent meta-analysis didn't go into factors like this. Their study is, is the crudest of the studies that you can think of. It's comparing one community with one fluoride level with another community at another fluoride level. And the reason that those are the crudest of epidemiological studies is you don't have a measure of individual exposure. But Zhang has a measure of individual exposure. He had the measure of fluoride in the urine. And that correlates with the lowered IQ and greatly strengthens his study. Next. The whole IQ curve was shifted for both males and females. Here's the, here's the, uh, the males. The, the, the blue line is the high fluoride village. The dotted mauve line is the low fluoride village. Now, Zhang estimated that the threshold for lowering IQ was at 1.9 parts per million. He took all his data, extrapolated. Now, next, think about it. An American child drinking two liters of water at one part per million is going to get a dose of two milligrams per day. One part per million is one milligram per liter. So if you drink two liters, you're going to get two milligrams. One of those Chinese children drinking one liter of water at 1.9 parts per million is going to get 1.9 milligrams per day. In other words, there would be an overlap between the dose which was found to cause harm in this Chinese village and the doses that some children are going to have in America. That fact alone should stop fluoridation. Next, but it's worse than that. There are now, as of September of this year, 33 published studies or translated studies. The Freud Action Network has been translating many of these Chinese studies, which is exactly what Choi and Grand Jean did at Harvard. They too were translating these Chinese studies that nobody had ever seen in the Western world. And the Harvard meta-analysis, Choi, in other words, they looked at 27 of these studies, high versus low Freud villages. Next, the study was published in Environmental Health Perspectives. That is one of the leading environmental health journals in the world. It is published by the National Institute of Environmental Health Studies. So that takes another argument away from them because they always say our studies are published in junk journals. Um, 26 of the 27 studies found a lower average IQ in the high versus the low village. That's an incredible consistency, 26 out of 27. In nine of the studies, the so-called high fluoride village had levels of fluoride less than three parts per million. Now, just to remind you, the spin 
put out by these public relations people that are running the corridors of your council here, your commissioners, these spin artists, put out the fact, oh, these were very high doses, 11.5 parts per million. Well, I believe that one village at the highest level was 11.5, but the average was nowhere near 11.5. And as you can see, nine of these villages were lower than three parts per million. Again, there's no margin of safety here. In 19 of the 27 studies, the difference in IQ was statistically significant. Next. And overall, the whole study found a lowering of 0.45 of a standard deviation, which translates to seven IQ points. Now, again, the spin artists were putting around that this was just a drop of half an IQ point, when in actual fact it was 14 times higher. The average was seven IQ points drop. Next. And it was significant. The Harvard scientists concluded that further investigation of fluoride's lowering of IQ should be a high research priority. That's what the NRC concluded in 2006. So how many studies then were done on IQ in America since 2006? None. How many were done in Australia, New Zealand, England, Ireland, Israel, all these other fluoridated countries? Answer, zero. So how many do you think are going to be carried out in the next six years? You bet. Uh, this is what Philip Grangine, who's very well known, by the way, for his work in environmental health. He was the one that did the mercury study in the Faroes Islands and, 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 and provided the, the ammunition that pregnant women should not get mercury. Another travesty that the American Dental Association is responsible for, mercury fillings, which they call silver fillings. Um, <laughs> he says... Fluoride seems to fit in with lead, mercury, and other poisons that cause chemical brain drain. The effect of each toxicant may seem small, but the combined damage on a population scale can be serious, especially because the brain power of the next generation is crucial to all of us. That was in the press release that accompanied this report. Now, I want to just spend a few moments to explain why this lowering of IQ, this shift across a whole population, could be very serious. Now, here's the normal distribution of IQ in a population. Now, the bell-shaped curve. So the average, most of us would have an average IQ of about 100. And some of us uh, would have an IQ above 130, above 140. We would be very, very bright in the genius class. And that's that green area under the curve. And over on this side, sadly, there will be a number of people, the area in the Mauve area, which would be, who would be less than 75, and they would be mentally handicapped. Now let's shift the curve over by five IQ points, five IQ points, which is what we think we did with lead and gasoline. Now, you'll notice that it makes, you wouldn't notice the difference between two pupils, between 195. But it does to the two tails. If you shift over by a small amount, you dramatically de decrease the number of geniuses in your society and you dramatically increase the number of mentally handicapped. That has huge social and economic ramifications for our population. So even if you don't give a damn about the health of your, your children, at least think about the economics, which is, seems to be the most important thing in this culture. <laughs> And so, when they give you this bogus study by Susan Griffin that for every dollar spent on fluoridation saves $38 in tooth decay, think of the billions of dollars that would be spent in this country dealing with a shift in, in IQ. Ding and others, a study in 2011, they looked at um, children the average level of fry was 1.3 parts per million. The range was 0 0.3 uh, to 2.84. Uh, next, their conclusions. Overall, our study suggests that low levels of fluoride exposure in drinking water had negative effects on children's intelligence. These are low levels now. Now, they didn't, in this case, look at a high village and a low village. What they did is they... they this area, that was the range of fluoride in, in the water. 
They didn't measure the level in the, in the water. What they did was to measure the level of fluoride in the child's urine, which told them the exposure, right? And then they plotted, here's the plot. They measured the, the um, for the different, they divided the children up into different levels of fluoride in their urine and saw how the IQ, the average IQ in the group, compared with the average IQ, the, the, de the, the, the deviation from the mean value. And you see that it slopes down. The higher the fluoride in the urine, meaning the higher the exposure, the lower the IQ in these children. Next. Um, 11 of the studies in the Choi review looked at urine levels and the level averaged less than three parts per million in five of the studies. Why is that important? Because in England, they've measured urine levels of fluoride. Not many people do. They don't measure it in the United States. But they found that 5.6% uh, of the kids had levels above three parts per million, and 1% uh, had levels over the four parts per million. In other words, our kids, in, at least in Britain, are being exposed to levels of fluoride which is lowering IQ, associated with lowered IQ in China. Uh, Zhang also measured the fluoride in the serum. Next. And this is the serum levels. You've only got a, a few very low levels of fluoride here, and I'm not sure the significance of that lying very slightly up. But in the high fluoride village, you'll notice that the higher the level of fluoride in the blood, the lower the IQ in the, the village. I asked uh, Zhang if he would put all the data together in one graph. I don't have the plot to show you, but when you put all the data together, you just get a slope going uh, downwards. So consider the weight of evidence. It, this is what you need. If you're going door to door, you need these facts if you can remember them. Over 100 animal studies show fluoride damages animal brain. One. Over 10 animal studies show that fluoride changes animal behavior. Now, the beauty of animal studies, if you accept the legitimacy of doing experiments on animals, which I have problems with, but if you accept, um, if you accept, you can control all those things. So when they are saying there's, there may be confounding variables that explain all those 26, 27 studies from India, China, Iran, and Mexico, that's because we, it's very difficult to control for all the factors in human experience. But when you've got these little animals in a cage, you control everything except the thing you're dosing them with, which in this case is fluoride. So when you see changes in behavior with the animals that are dosed by fluoride. It wasn't caused by coal burning, arsenic from somewhere else, or any other factor. Four studies show that fluoride damages fetal brain. In China, uh, you're only allowed one child per family. There are lots of abortions. And of course, there's lots of abortions in endemic fluorosis areas and non-endemic areas. And they compared the brains from these aborted fetuses and they found measurable changes in the brains of the babies born in the, in the aborted fetuses in the endemic areas. And 33 studies shows an association between modest exposure to fluoride and lowered IQ. And lastly, there are seven more human studies which don't measure IQ specifically, but things like memory, behavior, patterns, and so on, and they too have these effects are associated with fluoride. Now that's quite a weight of evidence. So what have we got in the other scale pan? Well, we know of one animal study done in America by Whitford that didn't find an effect. We know of one small IQ study done in New Zealand that didn't find an effect. We know of one small behavior study done in Boston uh, with a small number of, of, of children. And I just want to correct something. That is one, the one study in America that did look at uh, an effect as a, as a function of dental fluorosis, severity of dental fluorosis. Morgan and others, 1998. Okay. So there is the two scale pants. The six experts, after reviewing the literature on Florida and IQ, declared that the weight of evidence 
showed that there was no problem with fluoride in the brain. And I asked the question, what next, what weight of evidence are we talking about? The weight of evidence is overwhelmingly that fluoride is having an effect on the brain. Overwhelming. I have seldom seen a body of scientific literature which is so one way, so consistent. And yet, these people are prepared to continue to push this because they want to reduce a little bit of tooth decay. How much, how much, how much tooth decay would you want to save in order to justify threatening the IQs, IQ of your children? Now, I could go into other health effects. I could go into osteosarcoma and, and things like that, and I'd be happy to answer questions of them. But I think I've said enough. I hope I've sharpened the nail for you. And I hope I've given you the confidence to go out and fight like tigers to make sure they don't do this.